So, um, hello everybody. Um, today uh, is the second day of the conference, and we thought since there were people from various parts of the world, um, it would be great to get a kind of a panel going, what we call the transnational panel, sense of perspectives on big questions, deeper issues relating to global citizenship as personal pedagogical practice. Now, one of the people, people who played a big role in thinking about that was Rob Held of mine, who we all met yesterday. I hope he's okay. I don't know where he is. He's not here today. So we very ha kindly had um, uh, Joseph and George step into the, the gap to do a little bit of transnational other perspectives, and we've got Martin Hagen and Wendy Green here with us too. So Australia, sort of, <laughs> we're using you, if you're American side today, possibly more the Austrian approach, possibly more the English approach, without getting too essential. Um, so what we did last night when we sat and planned it, so was, um, we, we had a flexible agenda to begin with, but there were deep questions that everybody felt they wanted to consider. And the first one, I'm just explaining to you how we'll be running it. The first question was, what does it mean if you take internationalization seriously? So this linking to things, ethical dimensions and engagement and activism perhaps even. The second question is, what does global mean to you? How do you react to that question? And the last one we'd have is a formal question before, of course, people ask questions from the floor is, what are barriers you encounter in your local context? Those are the three questions we're dealing with. So we're going to run it sort of people speaking individually, but a bit as a conversation too inspired by yesterday. So perhaps I could start with you, Martin. Um, what would you reply to that first question? If you took international legislation <laughs> seriously, what would the international classroom look like? I think it would be, key word would be pluralistic, um, where it wouldn't prejudice the local knowledge of anybody that was involved. And equally, nobody would be prejudiced because of particular bodies of knowledge that they own. We play with words like equitable, equal doesn't work. I'm not sure equitable nearly works. I played with equitable, but Jude Carroll hate that word. <laughs> But it's something of those sort of general ideas where the playing field in the classroom is level and doesn't prejudice anyone uh, prior knowledge or prior experience or prior cultural background. That, of course, is a very huge step from the reality on the ground in most situations. Okay. I, I find it. Um, a very challenging question because of um, the, if you like, cultural values that are embedded in the classroom, some tacit, some explicit, uh, some with, to which I would subscribe and others to which I wouldn't. And I, I worry about the sort of equality when um, I don't want to slip into so complete relativism because I do think that there are some values which selfishly for me perhaps I would prefer to others and sort of implications and consequences beyond the classroom for social um, engagement that um, I might prefer to privilege over others. But, to what extent can my preference then be necessarily privileged within within the classroom environment? So it is a it's a thorny question when when we get into uh, value laden education. Mm -hmm. That's kind of copying out of the question. No, 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 not at all. No, no, no. Juliet, can we ask questions within questions? It's, it's, it's an open dialogue. Something kind of comes up. Yeah. Because, you know, when Martin kind of was speaking about equity, equality, being equitable, all this kind of thing, uh, for me, I think one of the major issues, you know, if we're serious about internationalization, internationalization as a principle, one of the major principles has to be inclusion. And I think for us as academics on the ground, one of the big issues is balancing two theoretical positions. 
do we buy into, well, inclusion means that everybody has the same opportunities, that, uh, that no one is disadvantaged? Or at the other end of the spectrum, does inclusion actually um, uh, you know, mean that we design a curriculum to enable all to succeed? Now, those are two quite different positions. Mm -hmm. The, the one kind of suggesting is, is how we balance this, well, yes, of course, you need a certain type and amount of academic cultural capital to succeed. There is a way in which we do it around here. But then the other side, that's, that's not necessarily inclusion. It's inclusion one time. But in terms of this curriculum that enables us to succeed, there's the issue of the degree to which we acknowledge and how students own things of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's often, that, that kind of balancing act, the assimilation versus being inclusive and bringing in the student and the way they learn and their experience, etc. That's often put across as one of the, the most difficult challenges for academics in these multicultural classrooms. And I was wondering what the perspectives of the panel might be on tackling that, you know, within their own contexts. I, I have to agree to everything that was said, um, especially with uh, That's not, 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 not that the English is my boss. But I agree the fact that, and coming back to the question, to take it seriously, and I, I think that I'm not sounding provocative, but I would argue we have to take it less serious, probably, mm -hmm. in just what you said, in, in you know, looking uh, or being a bit more relaxed about the about, uh, Probably the concepts we are mm -hmm. talking about, and I mean it was a lot. And, and don't get me wrong, I think it was more about uh, a lot of talk about agency and uh, activism, uh, you know, and just I think about leaving, maybe making the framework, the framework work, and, and you know the environment, and this can be you know sort of university as a community, you know the place and spaces of, of, of communication and community. Uh, but you know, giving students or whoever is involved some sort of agency and, and some some space to self-organize, maybe. And, and uh, so, so this is probably what I what I express as being you know a bit more playful uh, and uh, you know less mm. uh, less taking seriously. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I, I think that's that's quite interesting. We really need to have some serious um, background and ongoing conversations about what it actually means. And I think that um, I find the whole term internationalisation uh, quite problematic. Um, it's probably unrealistic. Um, um, I think, um, just going back to Martin's talk yesterday, um, a notion of layers building on. Um, the same thing but becoming more sophisticated. I actually think they're different. Um, internationalisation refers to um, exchanges between nations, political or economic, um, and higher education. I think it was found in um, the, the marketing, the marketisation of students moving between the nations. Um, what we're talking about at this conference is something entirely different. Um, and yet, the two, those different things get sort of confused and overlaid. And I think that we need to spend a lot more time uh, in conversation, uh, pulling these, all of these things apart. I, I think they're, they're not, um, they're not, you know, I think they're in conflict. And I think we have to acknowledge that we're talking about quite different things. Um, and they don't easily fit together at all. I think the exchange of students and the marketisation, et cetera, et cetera, between nations, that is part of our context, but it's not what we're talking about. Um, we're, we're actually talking, I think, in broad terms about um, developing students as graduates who can function ethically um, in the world as it's changing. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I think that. Um, some really serious conversations need to occur in our own universities, mm -hmm. as well as more in the literature. Um, so hard to have those conversations, though, because 
you have this problem of you know what is a nation to begin with, and yes, and, exactly. and yes, there's you know, political boundaries and maps, and you have sort of histories of, sort of internationalism, what internationalism meant in the you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, and what it meant in the 60s, 70s, 80s with national liberation fronts, and you, you begin to sort of move into kind of a uh, ethnic nationalism, if I can call it that, all of which kind of resonates in, in, in difficult ways with. With this term, so what, you know, what, what are we engaging with? You know, you know, the one, we think we know until we start asking the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, internationalization is coupled with curriculum. So we talk about internationalization in curriculum, and that's um, a very um, standard and dominant discourse through universities. Every university has discourses around that. Um, and a curriculum is the same thing. It's a very ideologically laden, very thorny, um, very contextual uh, uh, term, and yet we we use it in a way to sort of paint around for all of those differences. And I think that's another term that needs to be opened up for debate. Uh, um, Stop being accepted as a given one. The area of ahead with the curriculum is to take some of the more prescriptive elements out of it. Allow. If you're going to accept the idea, a basic idea is plural, pluralism, plurality within the, the, uh, the student body. You have to allow each of those types within the plural matrix to develop in their own way, using their own strengths, and to encourage them to acquire other strengths as well from the other aspects that are around them and are available in the world. The problem, I think, with a lot of our curricula is that they are very point-focused and we don't allow that freedom to develop. And that's the real challenge in the classroom, I think. And I think a mark of an internationalized classroom would be that it did permit people to build on their own strengths and also, if they were so minded, to explore the, the strengths of others. So I might start also and think about we actually support the practice of mindfulness and what you say we bring our own values into the classroom, into the discussion. And I don't think we reflect enough on the fact that there is that plurality out there. And it's, um, we were talking about this earlier, the different learning communities. And that is not just people from other countries, but you're having more disabled students in their classroom, students who are bipolar and whatever. And we as faculty members aren't really equipped with dealing with these issues or reflecting in people's analysis. And I think that's an important thing. It has to start not just with them as a community, but it has to be part of that learning mm -hmm. the teaching. Mm -hmm. One of the problems I have with um, this analysis is brought in, again, the whole movement of inclusivity. And inclusivity sounds nice. But when you see it in practice, it's often um, institutionalizing tolerance for something that's different. So in fact, there's a sort of protective bubble produced around people who are different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the end result in, in my yeah. Yeah, experience of a lot of what passes yeah. for inclusivity within the classroom. I mean, we need to get beyond that, I think. Well, but that's how institutions, I think, appropriate the mm -hmm. inclusion agenda. But what I'm talking about is you, Martin, as an academic in the classroom, and you are you, you do have these multiple identities, multiple ethnicities, etc., and you are having to work with them. And day in day out, you are facing that challenge. I know this university, this program. There are ways in which students are expected to engage, to 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 be assessed, to develop, etc. But that is not being really inclusive. How do I actually acknowledge that these students themselves bring something to the table which is of value and it might actually influence my pedagogy? How, how do I manoeuvre within the constraints of learning outcomes and periodic program reviews and all this kind of thing? You know, and, and ensure that within that kind of almost top-down regime, you know, the institution saying, well, you want to get this degree, this is how you've got to do it. Um, you know, how you can value what the student brings to the table, but not in such a way as they actually get to the finish line of the system and end up failing because the institution has this vision of what this is. You assimilate, you become what we want you to do. You know, these are the requirements. And that's so you know, in a way, that kind of institutional 
procreation, as you say, it's, it, it's meaningless. It's, you know, what matters is what you're actually doing on the ground as an academic, you know, because you're living it from day to day. And, and that's what I was interested in. To some extent. Kind of exploring. I mean, we all want to keep our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Yeah, that's very valuable. <laughs> yeah, very valuable. The, because employer, you know, the, the instrumental point, if you like, but now it's employability that seems to be the thing that's driving us. That's the that's what we have to achieve. You know, we may have had to have achieved other things in the last five or ten years, whether it be access, access or diversity, or now it's employability and. Competition in the global markets and we get to global and and I don't quite like competition. Um, um, but is it my role to um, render my students unemployable in the global market? Um, in some ways, that might be considered success. But, uh, you've recorded it. <laughs> I'll probably be visited. But that's the tightrope you're walking in the main day out, George. That is your tightrope. That's your problem, you know? Mm -hmm. Figuring out how you do both things. Sorry. 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 It's around this kind of pluralism culture and the original point you made, George. I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Anne Phillips' work on multiculturalism and multiculturalism without culture. Um, one of the things she argues in there, she, she comes from a legal background, and she gives many fascinating case histories of where cultural defences and, and rights issues meet, meet um, meeting as contradiction and tension. And I just worry about this idea of students being bearers of cultures, and I think university is also about any student freeing themselves from their cultural formation. So I, 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 I just worry that we're sort of going down the road of seeing our students as, as bearers of readable, easily readable cultures rather than people who we're encouraging to problematize their cultural formation, whoever they are, wherever they are. Yeah. And in the mix is the issue of some people's cultural ideas. A, a culture has to do too much work as a term, I think. Um, there, there, there may be non-inclusive ideas within those cultural notions that one would want the business of the universities to debate and be critical of them. I come from an Anglo-American background, one parent from either country, and the whole myth that I grew up with could be sort of summed up in a performance poet, Rob G's performance, which goes, we won, we won. We won, we won, we won. Um, and and it's you know, the First World War, the Second World War, the American Civil War, we won. Um, I did some work in some Eastern European countries and I was talking to people about, uh, yes, that was the era of the Swedish domination, and this was the era of the Polish domination, and then we were subordinate, and the whole sort of national mythos was we lost, we lost, we lost. And, and I hadn't sort of, you know, it was this kind of big understanding that there are these sort of huge kind of national myths that we bear. And in the, in the Anglo-American world, a lot of the stuff comes out of kind of almost a guilt reaction to this kind of dominant cultural position. And a, a reluctance to sort of even think about, even to privilege, even to give ourselves the right to think about ourselves. And I, I don't know where that goes, but this sort of, little kind of, um, so it, we're all from Surrey, the point that you were making yesterday, and not seeing that, um, and, and how, how, to, how, how to live within it comfortably, how to live comfortably within our own skin. I want to add to that because I think from an international student perspective, and I came here as an international student, so I to continue work, but I think that's very interesting you know, that Europe nation and in my PhD I worked a lot on national identities in my own country in relation to tourism and the formation of uh, national identities through, you know, tourist representations. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting what happened because I had always a very critical uh, perception of Austria being, you know, again, we lost, we lost, we lost. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> from being a big empire to, you know, that's the whole story that, you know, Beethoven was Austrian and Hitler German. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the, 
the whole idea of coming to the UK then as an international student in a way enhanced my national uh, identity in a way. Because first of all, there were not uh, many of us. <laughs> uh, second, I have to explain where, where Austria is exactly. Do you speak German? Uh, uh, things like that. So it was, uh, a, and, and something which if you read Hertzfeld's book, and, and this is very much about culture, it's not striking out the culture, but uh, it's, it's an American approach, it's, it talks about cultural intimacy, the way you use culture in certain uh, situations where it comes in handy, and in other situations where you probably don't use it or you, you blend it out, so I think it's a very uh, flexible use of, of, of culture and your, your own probably cultural identity in this case, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. one, of the, you know, my, one of the ideas I found most useful was from Jason Hill, who you mentioned, yeah. who talks about moral cosmopolitanism and sees a cosmopolitan as someone who is um, put in both cultures and can put himself on the boundaries or put herself on the boundaries and operate in either one yeah. and see the weaknesses and strengths in both and yet stand outside at the same time. Uh, talks about cosmopolitanism in exactly the same way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the wisdom of forgetting where you come from some of the time. And the privilege of being able to, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a skill, it's something you have to work on. Yeah. We were talking about um, transformation and the rest of it um, in the last talk we had from Cardiff. Uh, yeah. so Transformation is interesting because transformation is what, what we seem to be talking about all the time. We talk about the change of the universities and the change of the classroom and the change of individuals. And it worries me a bit because it has a sort of social engineering aspect to it. But I, I come out of a science background, like some of the others here, and I know that transformation can move in three different directions. If you look at a system's transformation capacities, the first it transforms to something more evolved and more subtle. Second is it degenerates into chaos and confusion. And the third is it heads to extinction, probably. Mm -hmm. Those are the three processes of transformation in system science. And when we use the word transformation, I think we spend all the time talking about transformation as being a positive thing. Mm -hmm. And we don't spend that much time wondering about what happens <laughs> in the other circumstances and who might be affected. If I can just step out of my role of chair for a minute, which um, I, I don't know if it means you can't speak, but I would like to speak, so I'm stepping out of it and transforming myself momentarily. But I, I, I'm hearing these things like, it was this phrase that struck me, all to succeed, and that leads to your idea of being ethical and, and encouraging our students to think ethically, because in our national education system there are ways of approaching it, the whole idea of right and wrong has become a bit lost in a world in which the consumer mm -hmm. paradigm dominates mm -hmm. and capitalism is so normal we can't imagine an alternative to it. So I think something very interesting can be done in discussions with students, you know, irrespective of cultural ID, around what are the big issues, and this is sort of what I said in the opening speak, what are the issues we need to address and what are the ethical decisions? Now, if, if, if to succeed means to carry on reproducing a global system that is not really making any but the very few happy, or it may give us jobs, but, you know, it, and so I think in a way this is what we can do. And these, people, they, they, these can be conversations you can have at international steering groups. I mean, they're thinking about how we can make the campus at Brooks look a properly internationalized campus, but that will not include getting restaurants from the Cal Road in Ireland, which seems, you know, a contradiction in terms. It will be Starbucks and yeah, on a brand at the time. So I think that there's plenty of signs on campus. We, we can we can say, look, what you know, what, what what's going on here in terms of uh, we, we are meant to employ you. We you want a job. We all understand that. We want our jobs, you said it, but it, it's that sort of ethical questioning of the system that provides jobs of a certain kind in general, and can we not different economies of imagining really yeah. is what I think would be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. and I've, I've heard um, 
several times um, the past couple of days um, the word imagination and mm -hmm. something that I talked about a little bit um, yesterday in my paper as well <coughs> but it's come up in, in almost every session, every paper that I've been to um, and it's, it seems to be really critical and it's not something that we often talk about in higher education but um, I really like um, the concept of the social imaginary and um, Lynn Gavin Lisby um, take that up and, and talk about it in relation specifically to higher education. It's, it's very interesting. Um, you know, they, they are saying, you know, that um, internationalisation of curriculum or global citizenship or something um, within higher education, um, it is, it's dominated by a neoliberal social imaginary. And by that, they mean they're talking about um, the way that people make sense of ideology, and um, and so um, it's it's um, they're talking about the ability and the limitations on people uh, on people's um, what they can imagine is possible in the future. For instance, um, what they see is is um, right and what they see is wrong, and um, that. If we listen to the conversations on campus between academics and between students, I can hear that there is a, a neoliberal kind of social imaginary that is dominant. Um, it comes through a lot of the reactions, a lot of the um, responses to the sort of work I'm doing. And, but then there are other imaginaries, I and mean, we really don't think that we need to be determined by this. There are other imaginaries that we don't think that we need to talk about some examples of that. Um, and so it's possible, and I think um, I really like that emphasis on the social. It's not an individual imagining. Uh, we imagine within a collective, within a social. Um, and um, so I think part of our job, is to try and create and foster that collective imagination, um, to start imagining different ways of understanding our world and different ways of seeing future possibilities. Yeah. Um, and, and of course at the same time that involves some um, some pretty hard critique of um, um, the um, um, discourses. And they have to do it outside the institutions sometimes because the oh. institutions have become yes. so so modeled on the yeah. what we call the neoliberal imaginary yeah. Yeah. Um, that they 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 are charged with replicating it. Yes. But it's uh, talking and I agree with what you said earlier. I like the you know, imaginary communities. Yes. Going from imagined communities yes. because yes. the nation center we talk about internationalization and uh, thinking of imaginary communities but also how, how we, we can use this neoliberal mindset of you know young people or consumer mm. cultures mm. we're all part of that uh, and, and turn it around probably you know, or, or probably use it in a way to, mm -hmm. to uh, be constructed or, you know, politically deconstructed yeah. or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, but I think, because I think one of the key ideas, we, I think, which came up for me the last two days is also how we, it's a very old philosophical problem, was about individualism or uh, collectivism. Do we, do we look at, you know, the student or the person in our staff as a very, you know, a person to be with, to be put him or her in a box, you know? Uh, or do we talk about this uh, sort of collective uh, community sort of thing? So I can also you know, give an answer to that, but I think that would be a way to to tackle our you know, the problems and uh, the, the terminologies we, we, we work with. And yeah, to bring I think it's a very difficult task. You know, I've been, I've been working with um, a group of journalists in academics, um, and you know, um, they um, very quickly um, critiqued and reconstructed the whole internationalization of curriculum. And what they determined that it actually would mean for them is a de westernization of their mm -hmm. curriculum. And that was a very, very exciting moment and it really brought everyone together quite passionately. Um, uh, from that moment, um, it, it then slowly appeared to them how very difficult that would be. Um, <laughs> um, very, very challenging because, you know, how do you do that? I mean, let's look at our textbooks. Oh, they're all American. Oh, um, 
Why are they all American? Because they're the only textbooks that are available. And then why is that? And then so on. So, okay, if we're going to develop, um, you know, literature that are going to help us de-westernise our curriculum, my God, you know, that's a, that's a whole lot of work in itself. So, um, you know, it's, but it, it's an ongoing project and they are still working and they're still very passionate. And I think it's because they're doing it together and because <coughs> they've created that space within the school um, to do that work together. And it does involve a lot of play and a lot of imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, that we have moments when we just, well, okay, let's just dream, you know, and let's have some fun and play with that, and then let's bring it back and, and so on. So it's that combination of play <coughs> and very hard, critical work. Mm. I like the social and national idea, but um, I sort of reject the idea. I can see neoliberalism is a dominant thing at yeah. the time, but yeah. I think it is probably just a phase. It's not even the only thing that we've got, mm -hmm. because I, I did actually, I wrote this up a couple of years ago, but if you compare what's happening in the discourse in the university and what's coming down from the United Nations, we can do so. Now that's talking about social justice, that's talking about pluralism, that's talking about uh, um, environmental and social sustainability. <coughs> the discourse is all there and it's at a higher level than the nation state. Um, I think we could do much more to play along with it. I'm not saying that it's not westernized very heavily. I'm not saying it's not dominated and bureaucratic and the rest of it. For all its flaws, it's still saying something is a bit And elements. it's also yeah. um, not entirely true that that isn't our alternatives out there, but you have to go and look for them in terms of textbooks. I came across a book down here in the Abbey Library, it's certainly caught me. And the title caught me by attention because it was called The Economy of Permanence. And it was written in 1945. I mean, what is that, 20 years before anyone was thinking about permanence? It's all about growth. It's still the diet that discourse is about growth. Mm -hmm. And this had a very interesting worldview wrapped up in it. And it's not dissimilar to the one I dished out with the layers in many ways and, uh, mm -hmm. earlier. It was written by Pandit Kumarapa. So it's from the Dharmic traditions. And built into it was a, a, a Dharma discourse, and Dharma, of course, means right action. It's a, 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 a doctrine of duty rather than personal gain. It's responsibility. Mm -hmm. But he looked at the world's evolution in three steps. The first, he saw a sort of animalistic stage. And then he saw our present society as conceived there, which was partly socialist in those days and partly capitalist and critique that. And he found that the highest stage, in his view, was an economy of service, he called it. Mm -hmm. And he compared that to a um, bird looking after its chicks mm -hmm. in the nest, in the jungle. He said, well, the bird's not thinking of its own welfare, it's thinking of the future. And that's what's mm -hmm. going on there. And that was the highest economy, in his point of view. Mm -hmm. So these themes, I and mean, then that's part of the Savoya discourse, which has continued through to this mm -hmm. present day. It's not so much that it, these things don't exist, they're just excluded from our, um, uh, or, or marginalized, or mm -hmm. cordoned off into a little area mm -hmm. labeled exotic, mm -hmm. so no one will look at them. But the logic isn't to reject books because of their provenance. I mean, yeah. That's got a very sinister history to it. So yeah. it's not whether it's an American book that is relevant, it's whether it's a good book mm -hmm. that's relevant. And of course we have to be mindful of provenance and we have to be mindful of the limitation of some of the, the, the provenance of some of our texts, but I think it would be very dangerous to de-westernise. I think that's a very dangerous notion. Mm. There's elements of what I'll call carefully the Enlightenment project that I wouldn't want to lose. Yeah, well, there's some great literature and so on. I don't think, I don't think um, their journey is finished. You know, I think that that was a moment of revelation for them. And as they go on, um, of course, it becomes far more complicated. And, um, but I think what's interesting and exciting is that it is an ongoing journey, but it does involve many, many, many across the school. Um, and it has created space for debate and so on. So, um, and, you know, I think that term de-westernisation was just an attempt to let's 
try to um, stick ourselves from this internationalisation of curriculum because it is so dominated by institutional and government discourses. And let's try to find another word we can play around with. And so, you know, it may not be eventually what they where they land, but um, it's it's a start. And it's interesting that there are these movements in the narrative where things immediately crystallised and very exciting, seem simple, and then come apart again as people look at them more closely. And then they maybe get another moment where there's some consensus and so on, and then it goes on. So it's a it's an ongoing narrative, and I think that's the important thing. And of course, being journalists, they understand that it's a you know it's a narrative, it's an ongoing narrative. And I don't think actually. The, the idea of de-westernisation is particularly helpful, I mean, because that's a respectable theme and it's all right. It's just actually restoring some form of balance. Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. And that, that's not a very easy thing to argue for, is balance. It's much mm -hmm. easier to say, no, a total overthrow, as we used to say in the student days, total overthrow of the whatever system happened to be around at the time. Mm -hmm. but there's a no, you need to take on... Position around this notion of it extends the discourse. It determines the discourse. Yes, it expands the mind. No, uh, uh, just adding to that, really, I think uh, I think it would also be a bit uh, short-sighted to talk of the westernization in a way. Simply, and I was inspired a bit by yesterday's, uh, you know, final discussion on the on the Schmorian Museum because that is so historical. I mentioned mm -hmm. we do, and we we tend to really think you you you're picking up a book from the 1940s. You know, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Reef and I recently got on world mindedness you know, in the 1930s. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but also, if you think of the uh, Europe Orientalism, which was also mm -hmm. picked up uh, during this conference, and in addition to that, the Europe Self Orientalism, which happens probably in the East, uh, mm -hmm. uh, picking up. So, so the idea of that these things, again, they are uh, emergent, they are, mm -hmm. they are in process, and we can't uh, you know, look at them you know, as an isolated mm -hmm. yeah, East West. Mm -hmm. And there's always been. <laughs> The mm. flow of, of, mm. of thoughts and, and people. Mm. And, and mm. Mm. Just like, you know. Yes, I like, I, I like what you were saying about this, um, the social imagery. But I also I like the fact that you brought in the balance of play plus critical analysis. Yes. Mm. Mm. And it feels, because I'm in a slightly different academic field, particularly in public health, but um, the students that we have bring a lot with them, mm. and undeniably. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily be, we, we do draw on quite a huge breadth of international work, in fact, within health. Mm -hmm. We would. Mm -hmm. um, and they also draw on it themselves, and they, they you know, initial, initialize that, but I appreciate that. I guess where I'm coming from is that what they come out with at the end of it is actually something also to do with the relationship. Um, that we, I'm sure you talked about yesterday, but um, it seems to me that when you're placing someone within a, um, an employment field, which is kind of part of this whole debate, you know, what are people leaving with, that part of their experience is going to be their relationship, their relationship with either a global philosophy or value, um, but also the relationships they build within the classroom mm -hmm. or within the college. And so George brings in a kind of social aspect because you're thinking, well, everything's so dictat that you, you know you can't have the imagination in this. You know, you create something. So there's some balance there about being able to allow that relationship to build. And I have a concern that, in fact, within our own students, um, and ethnic relationships don't aren't that broad. They tend to become inter inter country and not cross country, cross cultural in their discussions because it's just easier for them when they're learning about things. Mm. So it's actually trying to be much more imaginative in the way that we almost enable relationships and a reflection on how you build those relationships seems to be as much as important mm. when they go out into the real world as it would be on being critical about anything that they pick up to read or use as information. So, and the pluralism will be within their own remit, surely. You know, we have more control over that for what we 
I'm enabling is this critical aspect of being able to recognise what's going to be useful and what isn't as part of our education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I'm sure critical analysis of any relationship is going to be insightful in terms of uh, what we still call internationalisation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Relationship of you know the book with its mm -hmm. origins mm -hmm. and its provenance. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an analysis that's going to be insightful mm -hmm. in terms of understanding what global relations mean. Yeah. Uh, you know, we haven't got around to this question because there doesn't seem the need to force that agenda, but it does link very much, I think, to what is the global. And, and it's ask. seeing how that... I was going to ask you, so the, mm -hmm. what, what was your take on the distinction between global versus international? Um, yeah. And then the question has been in there. And it was mm -hmm. Um, well, it was, I think, something we've discussed together, so but I'm, I'm happy to maybe answer it. So I invite you to come in as well. Doing the eye to eye contact with me. Yeah, no, so, I was well, yeah, invited. No, yeah. I think the difference is, um, for me, uh, global is this. Um, <laughs> um, global is the, the word that's almost by its existence, because I was talking yesterday in my presentation about metaphors and the way structure our lives, is determining, for example, the way people perceive relations around the world. So America, I'm sure you've read this in the newspaper recently, to be a global super, if it's going to be a global superpower, that will then structure the way it, 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 it shapes its activities and as a nation in relationship to the rest of the world. So, when I hear the word international, it does not have a tool. Like it. it does have metaphorical force, but it links to ideas for me personally of um, essentialism, which around nation and inter, that I find incompatible with my own epistemologies around relationship and dialogue. So, yeah, that's my take on it. Uh, but you two, I'm sure, have your own thoughts to be discussing why we wanted to have those two questions. Yeah, of course, mine comes out of the um, background in Eton College and areas of this sort. So I look at it as a shift from um, the international, which I see as being purely anthropocentric, human centered, mm -hmm. to um, global, where we're talking about something which is much more ecocentric, that looks at the whole of the planetary system rather than just the human part of it. And I think that's a very critical distinction. NACE puts it forward as a kind of process of maturation. It moves from the personal self to the we self there is to be defined as a social self, a social group or a nation, hopefully eventually all of humanity, um, which is the step we're usually trying to negotiate, I think, in, in these meetings. But there is a step beyond that, and I think that's the key one, to see the whole living support system and um, itself within it. Do you have anything to add? I know it wasn't your favourite second question. Yeah, I think, um, well, um, I think the only way to answer it is, you know, what does global mean for me? I think um, it, it is it's such, such an incredibly um, loaded um, word and does so much work in our world um, and um, it, it, it is it is in fact on that social imaginary and um, and it's, it's the bound of an ideology and so on so um, and it's and also through history I guess it's changed too. So I think it's it's only ever going to be what it means for me, how I imagine um, myself in relation to the world and um, so it's always going to be about positioning um, myself and understanding that position in relation and it's, 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 it's very it's all about relation um, and that is I guess because I'm in such a fortunate position but that's always going to be changing um, and so I think part of my job as an academic is to be continually uh, reflecting on what that means um, and um, 
and I guess because I have such a rich life and I'm able to travel and I'm able to connect with people in lots of different places and I have all of this education, then um, that story is always going to be changing for it. Um, and the fact that I've been, uh, well, I've been away for seven months and lived in three countries and worked with three different higher education sectors, um, just in this short period of my life, has has reorient disoriented me. <laughs> it will reorient me. Um, uh, yeah. So it's it's about you know me, um, my position, my my city, um, <coughs> my nation. Um, and Australia as a nation, uh, the identity, our identity um, is, has been in constant state of uh, fluidity um, since colonisation. Um, every generation it's been rewritten. Um, and it's always, always about who are we in relation to the rest of the world um, and all of the various groups that our people have. Uh, and the uh, and, uh, ongoing um, saw um, across the country uh, in relation to the place um, because it's not ours. It's, uh, it's, it's um, um, and then we're there. <laughs> so, um, and this is all shifting in relation to the rest of the world as our indigenous populations connect with indigenous populations across the globe. Um, and so their story of what it means to be connected and to be indigenous is also in a state of constant change and development. So it's, a, it's an ongoing narrative, I guess. Now, in terms of an ongoing narrative, it's nearly midday. <laughs> so perhaps we, unless, I, I would, if people would like to bring to the panel questions, issues from their sessions, we could have perhaps five minutes for that. But they may feel they don't want to bring anything from their sessions or panels. So I'd just like to say thank you very much to the panel members for having this chat. And we will have it on the record and it will be on the CCI website sometimes in case you want to use it as a potential educational resource, a personal loop, or whatever. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.